Hi everyone, Grandmaster Feingold here. Um, let's see, <laughs> I wanted to, uh, yeah. So there's been a lot of comments and actually some private messages about my videos and my page. And um, although I think for the most part people are being serious, it's still quite funny. So I think I, I learn more every day how Donald Trump got elected by seeing the, uh, the uh, super intelligence of, uh, of people on the internet. Okay, so um, I guess my, I should have some kind of contest for the, the, the comment uh, or paragraphs or soliloquies that make me laugh the most. But anyway, I guess the one that's made me laugh the most so far was the person who described themselves as a YouTube expert. I guess that means that they're, it's a euphemism for either unemployed or low IQ, I'm not sure. Okay, anyway, keep the comments coming because even when you're serious, they're, they're funny to me. So, All right, uh, today we're going to look at two games instead of one because they're semi-related. Uh, it was against uh, strong players I was playing in the same opening. Um, the openings are very similar. And in one game I won in 17 moves, and in one game I won in 23 moves against um, pretty strong players. Now, when I moved to Belgium in 1988, uh, the best player in Belgium at that time was Luc Winans, who was international master, later became a grandmaster. And we looked at this opening a lot. This was like his opening that he played against E4, and um, he taught me how to play it, so I played it a lot. And it's funny because uh, in the Rue Lopez, Black was usually playing A6, and Winans was playing this line with Knight F6 and then Bishop C5. And when I played knight f6 and bishop c5, uh, my opponents were not usually very well prepared, no matter what their ratings were. And then something funny happened uh, when Kramnik played the Berlin against Kasparov in the World Championship match and started drawing every game and it became very popular. This actually was beneficial to me. A lot of times when I play an opening that nobody plays, um, if somebody starts playing it, then people start preparing for it, and that's not good. I'm trying to play something they don't know. So actually, in this position, a6 was always the most popular move. And then when Kramnik started playing knight f6 and people were following him, people with white weren't, you know, taken aback by that. And it's funny because now they were expecting me to play knight takes e4. So when I played bishop c5, it was even more confusing because it used to be knight f6 semi-surprised them and bishop c5 was just a mild surprise. Now they expected knight f6 and bishop c5 was the big surprise. I, I've never played the Berlin and, and I never will. Okay, now in this position, white has two moves that are very reasonable that have good chances for advantage. Uh, in today's games, we're going to look at c3 because that's my opponent's played. The other move that's interesting is knight takes e5. And now black can actually take the knight on e5 or the pawn on e4. They're both playable. And the idea, of course, for white is this, you know, d4 trick. Okay, and then this is a lot of theory. There's a lot of different moves here for both sides. And knight takes e4 is, is also a move. Okay, um, and I've faced that before. In fact, I've played knight takes e5 and knight takes e4, just not both at the same time. Okay, but the games we're going to look at today start the same way. C3 with the obvious idea of playing D4. Castles, D4. Now, this is something I teach all my private students, so uh, you guys will actually learn something today. In double king pawn openings, uh, white in many different openings, Rui Lopez, Joko Piano, Italian game, uh, white often attempts or does play C3, D4. In these situations, when your bishop's on c5, which black says here, you have two choices. You could take on d4, or you can move your bishop. And I have a very simple rule that I made up, which seems to apply uh, at least 95% of the time. If white's king is on e1, because he hasn't castled yet, then you take on d4, take on d4, and play bishop b4 check. If white has castled, which is the case here, then you just move your bishop. Um, so that's, I play bishop b6. Now, white's not winning a pawn here, even though the e5 pawn is hanging, the e4 pawn is also attacked, so white's not winning a pawn yet. 
Okay, and he played bishop g5, which is the main move. Uh, actually, Luke Winans and I argued whether black should play d6 or h6 here. I think he thought h6 was not the best, but I do. So um, He's played h6 also. Okay, and the idea is if black tries to win a pawn, uh, black, if white tries to win a pawn by taking everything, uh, and now this pawn's not attacked, whoops, that was good on my part. This pawn is not attacked, and this pawn is attacked twice. Um, black actually can attack the pawn by taking with the queen, and you're attacking the e4 pawn. Actually, surprisingly, I've had this position, I think, twice, and it's equal, and, um, I think I won both games, but I, mean, I have to think back 30 years, not, not my strong suit. Okay, so after h6, it's more common to play bishop h4, which is what my opponent did, and I played d6. Now, white can win a pawn here by just taking everything, but then my bishop on b6 gets open, this pawn's weak, and these pieces aren't developed on the queen side. So theory actually doesn't like White just taking on c6, taking on e5, taking on d8, taking on e5. It thinks that black might even be slightly better there since white has a weak e pawn and white has no development and black has two bishops. So in this position, uh, this is where the games diverge. Um, now, this game that I'm showing you was played in 2002, and this is round seven of the World Open uh, in Philadelphia. This is actually the one where I tied for first. It was either a nine-way or a 10-way tie for first. Since it was 15 years ago, I, I can't remember. It, it was nine-way or 10-way, I know that. And we won, I think we won 3,300, which isn't really good for winning the World Open, but I guess when you have a, a big tie like that, you can't really expect a lot of money. Um, this is against Boris Kreiman. His rating is about the same as mine. Um, I think he just became a grandmaster at this point. And we were playing on board two, actually. Board one was Ona Shook, uh, playing Smirin. I actually don't remember who was black. I think Onishuk was black. Yeah, sitting right next to the game, you think I'd remember. I do remember before their game started, black had his king and queen set up wrong, and they were about to start, and I pointed that out, and then black switched his king and queen. So they were the best players in the tournament, and someday they'll learn how to set their pieces up. Okay, here, white made a known mistake. He played knight bd2. So remember out there, don't, don't develop your pieces. Okay, and actually, this was accompanied by a draw offer. Of course, usually black, you know, on board two in round seven of the World Open against a player of your own rating, drawing is okay, but, well, this just loses material. So the uh, queen was defending d4, and, and, and now it's not. Okay, so after long analysis, I took on d4. Obviously... I have more pieces on d4 than he does. So if he takes back, I just play knight takes d4 and win a pawn. So he took on c6. And if I take the bishop, then he'll take his pawn back. So I played the Zwischenzug, d takes c3. And then he played a desperado. If he just takes on c3 and I take on c6, I'm up a pawn. So he played bishop takes b7. And I took on b7, he took on c3. And you'll notice that material is equal. However, and this is actually very similar to the next game as far as the tactical idea. Uh, I can win material by playing the move g5. My knight was pinned, and now my knight's not pinned. So if he plays bishop to g3, I'll just play knight takes e4, and I'll have two bishops and an extra pawn, and he'll have two isolated pawns on the queen side. So he played what I expect. He sacrificed a piece. And for those of you who follow chess closely, which isn't a lot of you, uh, this sacrifice was seen not in this position, of course, in the last game between Magnus Carlsen and Sergei Karyakin in the last round of Tata Steel. Now, in that game, this was very strong for White. This is not as good because um, there's very few pieces on the board and Black's already developed. Okay, King g7 defends the knight. Now I'm threatening to move my queen away from the pin. So he plays queen f3. And now I blundered, in quotes, but my move actually isn't bad. It's just that we missed all the tactics. Um, if you see all the tactics... You might play the roof rook b8, although it's not clear to me that rook b8 is better than what I did. Okay, um, the more you know. Okay, so I play queen e7. Now, white has a very nice tactical move, which gets his piece back, although black still has the advantage. Um, and we both missed this move. He can play e5. And now all the pieces are hanging. The queen attacks the bishop. The bishop attacks the queen. 
this knight is incredibly hanging and pinned. Okay. And the main line, according to the engine, is I take, you have to take my knight, and then when you take the bishop, material is equal if I play the move queen takes c3, which seems pretty obvious. And the computer says this is about equal. But actually, a better move, which I doubt I would have found, is d5. And the idea is, if you take on d5, you walk into a skewer, and you lose a piece. And if you don't take on d5, uh, I'm threatening rook to b8. And after rook to b8, you could take on d5 and lose your queen, uh, I'm sorry, and, and lose the knight. Or you could play queen a6, allowing bishop takes f2 check, and queen takes queen. So d5 is a very interesting move. And the computer says black is better. I'm not sure how much, like 0 0.3, 0 0.4. My favorite variation was in some line the computer suggested c4, and I was very confused because I didn't understand why this didn't just win a piece for black. It's the same position where black wins a piece before, but the pawn's on, not on c3, it's on c4. Well, that makes all the difference in the world. Now white has 94. Of course... If white's pawn was on c3, I could take the queen and take the knight and be up, or I could mouse slip, take the knight and be up a knight, but now my rook's hanging because he played c4. So after c4, this doesn't win a piece anymore. Anyway, uh, the variations are very complicated. I don't think I would have seen the move d5. I think I would have just, in after queen takes b7, I probably would, just would have taken on c3. And, you know, and, and after the move e5, uh, I would have been very upset because I didn't see e5. <laughs> so that would have not been good. Okay, so I played queen e7, missing e5. My opponent played queen g3, also missing e5. And luckily, he doesn't have a big threat here. He has a lot of discovered checks, but they don't really do anything. So I broke the pin with queen e6. And if he plays bishop takes f6, I'll just take with the king and I'm up a piece. He played the move knight f3, which threatens, let's say I make a stupid move, rook b8. That's a stupid move. Then he takes double check. My king's in check by two pieces. And then queen g5 may. That's why he played knight f3. Okay, unfortunately, I can play the move knight takes e4. And queen g5 is not going to be mate. For example, he could try the same double check, but it's not mate. My knight defends e4, or my knight defends from e4. And now he's down a piece for a pawn. And he's got nothing. There's no compensation here. So here he resigned. And the game only went 17 moves. The first eight moves of the game were just normal theory. On move nine, he made a mistake. And we both sort of didn't play well in the middle when we both missed e5. And after the game, uh, I went into the audience. There was like um, chairs to watch the game. And my good friend, Fide Master, and now Fide Senior Trainer, Avi Friedman, was there. And um, I don't think he was playing the term. He was just watching. And... Uh, I said, wow, I, I won quickly, and I played all this stuff that I saw. And then he said to me, what would you have done on, against E5? And I was like, oh, yeah, I didn't see that. So that was a, a letdown. Okay, I mean, I'm not losing after E5, but uh, I, missing it is not good. Okay, now the next game was played uh, 12 years earlier in Reykjavik, my only time in Reykjavik. And there was a match with four quote-unquote countries, Russia, uh, the U.S., um, England, and the Nordic countries. So that was that was that. It was a match between the four teams, um, and Russia won obviously, and I think the U.S. came in second, and England third. And they also had a big open tournament. And in fact, every year Reykjavik has a huge open tournament now, um, with you know 50 grandmasters at least. Um, I've never played in the big one they have now. They've had it for years. The one I played in was also very strong. That way I got to play in the tournament and I, I got to see the matches also. Uh, I was living in Belgium at the time. This was 1990. And uh, I, for some reason, it was cheaper to fly from Luxembourg than from Brussels. So I took a train to Luxembourg, which I guess was about an hour and a half. And then I flew. And I remember on the way back, it was 30 degrees below zero um, Fahrenheit in Iceland. And when I got to Luxembourg, which was a four-hour flight, it was 70 degrees um, Fahrenheit. So it was a 100-degree difference in a four-hour flight. I remember them de-icing the plane and then being really nice weather when I landed. Okay. 
So my game with Heller started the same way. Everything's the same as my Crimean game. Ferdinand Heller actually was higher rated than me by quite a bit. And he quit chess soon thereafter this game. Not sure if it was because of this game. And he became a lawyer. And so if you ever need representation in Sweden, and maybe you do, look up Ferdinand Hellers. Okay, and if you were paying attention to the first video, you'll notice that this is the exact same. All right, now try to use your brilliant mind, and I'm sure you're using it a lot when you send your comments to me. <clears throat> and remember what Boris played in this position. I said it was a bad move, the move that he offered me a draw with. And the answer is he played knight bd2. Okay, and Heller's played more normal. Bishop takes c6, takes on e5, and the move knight bd2. Now, if you're dogmatic, and you are, then you really like white because black's pawn structure doesn't make a lot of sense. He's got these doubled isolated pawns and isolated pawn here, and white's pawn structure is pretty good. However, black has the two bishops. Hooray! And this bishop's really good. Man, look at that bishop. And if he ever trades for my bishop, that fixes my pawn structure. So white has a tiny advantage here. Now, after knight bd2, he's threatening my, he's defending his pawn, so he's threatening this pawn, so I defended it. Okay. And now this is very funny. And I've told this story many times, but probably you, you never heard it. And if you did, you forgot, so it doesn't matter. Uh, when I played this game and I was in... Uh, Reykjavik in Iceland, uh, my good friend Luke Winans, who looked at this line with me a lot, this is his line, he was playing in a, in a zonal tournament in Lyon in France, which I think the, the zone is Luxembourg, France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. And he was representing Belgium. And we actually got home from the tournaments at the same time. And this was before the internet was popular, so I, we didn't, I didn't know what happened in his tournament. There was no like online coverage. Um, this is 27 years ago. Okay, and my phone rang when I walked in the door, and it was Luke. And I said, oh, I, I just got home, just walked in the door from my, my tournament in, in uh, Reykjavik. And he said, I just got home from my tournament in Leon. And we told each other how we did. And I said, I played Ferdinand Hellers, and I won with Black in less than 25 moves. And that was all he knew about the game. And his next, the words out of his mouth in response were, Queen A4? And I said, yes. So somehow he concluded, since I beat Hellers quickly and I was black, this position must have been reached, even though he didn't know what move one was for either color, and that Queen A4 must have been played. So that's, man, that shows you why he became a grandmaster. And I said to him, how did you know? And he said, I had this position in Leon, and my opponent thought about playing queen a4, but realized that it lost and played some boring move and the game ended in draw. Okay, and queen, if you have a really old ECO, in fact, there might not even be a newer one, this move is actually mentioned as being interesting. Unfortunately for my opponent, it loses a piece. Uh, the queen was defending the knight and now the queen's not defending the knight. So yeah, there's that. Okay. <laughs> So, um, of course, the knight's defended by the other knight, so I can't take it. I have to get rid of this knight. And if you want to attack a piece and make it move, you have to attack it with a smaller piece. Bishop g4 doesn't really do anything. If I play bishop g4 and bishop takes f3, it just, just takes back. Okay, so you have to attack it with a pawn. That's the only thing smaller than a knight. So g5. And you remember the first game against Crimin. I played g5 to unpin my knight. Here I played g5 to gain a tempo to play g4. And I remember after g5 him putting his head down and shaking it a lot. So he obviously was very unhappy. Okay, he played bishop g3 and I played g4. Um, he has a lot of ways to lose a piece here and get a pawn or two. He chose rook a d1. And now he's attacking my queen by discovery. So I move my queen. And he's got two pawns for a piece and my c6 pawn is hanging and I have a terrible pawn structure, but a piece is a piece. Okay, again, I want to remove the guard. I want to take his knight on e5. His knight's defended, so I played knight h5, getting rid of the bishop on g3. He played queen c6. I took the bishop, threatening his rook on f1. And now I could take his knight, and then he would take my rook on a8, and that's 
also good for black. But I played bishop b7, which actually is the computer move. And after we trade, my rook is defended. And um, I was confused during the game why he didn't defend his e-pawn. I thought he would play like rook fe1, defending his e-pawn. But the computer says he's in a lot of trouble after rook d8 because I'm threatening to take the rook and the rook is overworked. It can't defend the rook and the pawn. He can't defend his pawn again. His pawn on f2 is pinned. He can't play f3. And if he could play f3, it would be bad anyway. Um, and if he trades rooks to save his pawn, he's not going to be happy if I play rook d2. And if he stops rook d2, he's going to be even less happy. So actually, I didn't realize during the game how winning I was. Uh, rook fe1, rook ad8 is just incredibly winning. It's good to have an extra bishop. So after queen c6, attacking my pawn on h6, I defended it. He didn't defend his e-pawn. He just played rook d3. So I was like, all right. And traded queens. He stopped rook e2. I played rook e8. And he just resigned here. Having pawns for a piece is okay if you have a lot of pawns, but he has no passed pawns, no potential passed pawns. He has double pawns. I have the e-file. F2 is weak. So this is just an extra piece. And he resigned. So those were two games I won in less than 25 moves. I guess you can call them miniatures in the same opening where we had the same position after move eight and I had the black pieces. I'm a tiny bit worse in each case, but since I play the opening a lot, I sort of know the ins and outs and my opponents obviously don't face knight f6 and bishop c5 very often. In fact, if they face knight f6, they're probably facing the Berlin now with knight takes e4. And so bishop c5 is still pretty rare. So, well, those were fun games for me. They're memorable because I beat Grandmasters with the black pieces in a double king pawn opening, which isn't very easy. All right, I hope you enjoyed those games. Um, visit the website of the Chess Center, www.atlchessclub.com, and consider a donation if you like my videos, um, especially if you make snarky comments, you should donate more. Then I'll really enjoy your comments. And um, our Chess Center is going to open in September. We're looking at a couple of places now. I think we're going to narrow it down, and we're actually going to have a place in maybe two or three weeks that we're going to move into in August. Um, follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Facebook. You can either go to Ben Feingold or Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta. Please subscribe to my page here, and I'll see you guys tomorrow with a new video. Bye, everyone.